Revelation chapter 22 this morning. So if you have a Bible or a device to get to the scriptures, I want to encourage you to grab it and open up to that chapter. Excited to be able to share that book and chapter title this morning. We're coming to the end of our study through this book. And just by way of a little bit of a reminder, if you're just joining us in the last couple of weeks, you know, the book of Revelation's primary purpose is to reveal, to reveal. That's the primary purpose of this book, to to unveil, to uncover, or, or to make something manifest unto us. As you open up the book in chapter one, the author John writes this in verse one. He says, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ. It's revealing him, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is the report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And listen to this, verse 3. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church and blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. The book of Revelations, primary purpose. Does anyone remember what the primary purpose of the book of Revelation is? To reveal. You got it. You graduated from the book of Revelation. You're at the end today. That's its purpose. That's its intention, to reveal to us. Well, reveal what? Reveal Jesus, that Jesus is glorified and risen and the conquering king. That's why we sang to him and about him this morning. You see that description in that very first chapter of the book. Verse verse 8 says that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is and was and who is still to come. If you go on in that chapter, you see this this description of Jesus that's very different from the the physical description we see in the gospel accounts. In Revelation chapter 1, it says that he's wearing a long robe that is his head and his hair like white wool, white as snow, that his eyes are like a flame of fire, voice like the thundering mighty ocean waves. Jesus is revealed to us in the book of Revelation. But also, as we read in those first three verses of chapter 1, the book of Revelation reveals that there's a tremendous blessing promised within this book for all those who read, who listen, who obey what this book says. And it says that it reveals the events that soon must take place, it says. It's interesting. You know, the book of Revelation is one of the only books in the Bible that has two things. One, a blessing that's promised for those that read and obey and listen to the words of the book, but also one of the only books that comes with a divine outline. If the purpose of the book is to reveal Jesus to us, well, in verse 19 of chapter 1, John kind of writes exactly how he's going to lay out this revelation. In verse 19, he says, the angel tells John, write down the things that you've seen, the things that are now happening, and the things that will happen. Revelation is intended and designed to reveal to you and to reveal to me Jesus and his plan to uncover, to make it manifest to us, to unveil it. Now, Revealing something, uncovering, uh, making something manifest. That can be, a, uh, can be a positive or a negative experience. You ever tried to sell a home and had to do the WDO report? You ever done that before? And things come to revelation as you're getting ready to do that? It can be a positive or a negative experience. It can be a joyous occasion to reveal something. Or it can be, you know, kind of a letdown. When kids are young, it can be a joy for parents maybe on a birthday or a Christmas, to, to give or to unveil something that they've, they've longed for or asked for. You know, in our, our little family, I think I can use that adjective, right, little family? In our family, we, um, 
We kind of had that experience just this last Christmas. Let me show you what I mean, just by a way of a, like a simple little video into Christmas morning in our house this last year. We're almost ready. On the count of three, you'll be able to open your eyes. One, two. Okay, so you know what's about to happen, right? Okay, let's, let's just watch the rest of this. You know what's happened. They didn't, so let's watch. Look at the screen. On your birthday. So for us, that Christmas morning, it was a joy to unveil, to reveal. Now I've got to give you kind of a disclaimer to why there was that pause in the video. We, my wife and I were thinking, how can we kind of reveal this gift? Because Christmas, when they first wake up, it's going to be a little sparse. I don't know if you know this. Disney's expensive, and so like that, that is Christmas, that is birthday, that is anniversary, that is everything for the year 2023. Um, so we had this Christmas blow-up toy. You see Mickey over there on the right? And so I thought, well, maybe I could bring in Mickey from the outside. I could like do it that way. So when the kids first saw Mickey, my oldest daughter thought, Dad got us another blow-up for Christmas? Like, that's, that's our gift? I said, no, 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 look at the screen. And then there came that joyous expression of that which was revealed is finally understood and embraced, and they're excited for it. Like, you know, to reveal something, to unveil something, it can be a joyous occasion. But I remember another Christmas, one of our first Christmases together as a family, which we only had our, our oldest daughter, Lily, and she was at the age where an outdoor swing set and slide, that was the thing to have. And so we bought and assembled the set, and that Christmas morning, we had Christmas inside together. It was just a little family of three. And I remember walking Lily outside and saying, okay, we've got one more big gift for you. And I had covered the, the slide and the swing set with this huge brown tarp and, and big red bow. And my wife was holding her, and we, we kind of did the countdown thing, you know. And as I pulled the wrapping and the bow off the set, I couldn't wait to kind of, I don't know, hear that squeal of excitement from a little two-year-old. And as I unwrapped that beautiful blue swing set and slide, she responded, but not with squeals of excitement, but with tears, sadness, concern. She wanted the brown tarp and she wanted the red bow. She was totally distraught about its disappearance, like did, could care less about the slide, the swing set. The tarp was gone. You know, the tarp that you have in the backyard all summer just to cover things, like that's what she was upset about. Well, as we've been going through the book of Revelation together, we have experienced the revelation that it's truly a blessing, a blessing that which is shown in the book of Revelation. What's been revealed is a joyous blessing. And remember what's been revealed, right? We've learned that Jesus loves his people. He loves the church. Those are the first five chapters. We, we saw Jesus in heaven, the letters to the church, and that heavenly scene. We saw that Jesus is full of mercy and justice. Chapters 6 through 19, the bulk of the book, this dynamic of the great tribulation and judgment and the beast and the false prophet finally being judged, we saw this interplay of God standing in righteous judgment. And if I can have your attention, if I can see your eyes, he's the only one qualified to do that. And he, he must do that if he's God. And we see how that unveils in this book where he stands in righteous judgment over sin, but always extending the hand of mercy. And we've learned together, we've been seeing together that Jesus overcomes the millennial reign, Satan being judged, and eternity with God. Now, as we look at chapter 22 today, we're picking up right where chapter 21 left us. In chapter 21, we're given a glimpse of what's called New Jerusalem, this great city that is to come. And the Apostle John, he shared kind of a, a glimpse or an outward perspective of what that city would look like, like the walls and the gates and the foundations. 
And in the first five verses of chapter 22 today, we're kind of given a more inward, even a more intimate description and perspective of what's to come. See, chapter 22 gives us a description of heaven with the river of life and the tree of life being there. And heaven has been described as a kingdom, as a city. And now the description that we're about to read is it's almost garden-like within that city. Look at verse 1 of chapter 22. If you're there with me, let me know by saying, Jesus overcomes. Jesus overcomes. Okay, verse 1, reading from the New Living Translation, here's what the Word of God says. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. As John describes what he sees, he's drawn back, it seems, almost to the, the very beginning in his mind's eye, the, the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 2 tells us that in the Garden of Eden, there were actually four rivers. But in this heavenly city that is to come, there's one river that flows directly from God's throne, symbolizing God's purity, the purity of his rule, and the life-giving and nurturing nature of the rule and the reign of God. Think about that sentence for just one second. The life-giving and nurturing nature of the rule and reign. Quite often, those words don't go well together. But in this heavenly city, where everything is finally set right and God is ruling and reigning, John sees this river of life flowing from the throne of God. In the Garden of Eden, Adam was forbidden from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and prevented from eating of this tree of life. But look with me what happens in verse 2. It says, On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. And the leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. The river and the trees symbolize the abundant life that will be in that heavenly city. It'll be glorious. But, but you might ask, what does this mean? That, that the leaves will be used as medicine to heal? We know from God's word, Revelation 21, that there will be no more death, no more pain in heaven. So what does this mean? That the leaves of this, this tree of life are medicinal. Well, the word in Greek for healing is therapeia meaning therapeutic. And I love what one author says about this. He says, rather than healing from sickness, these leaves will guarantee the continued health and vigorous living that we'll already be experiencing. In heaven, no one will be calling in sick or wearing masks to protect themselves from disease. Those days will be done. It's not like you're getting a card to the fruit of the month club, and that's what the tree of life is. It's this symbol, it's this central piece proclaiming that in this great heavenly city, there's purity, there's life, there's wholeness, there's vitality. It's glorious. And as it says in verse 3, look at what it says there. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. One author says this, no more curse takes us back to Genesis 3, where the curse began. Interestingly, even the Old Testament closes with the statement. He's quoting from Malachi. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. But in the New Testament, there's this announcement, and there shall be no more curse. Satan will be consigned to hell, and all of creation will be made new, and the curse of sin will be gone forever. This is the heavenly scene, dear church. And now John makes these seven statements using the word will or shall, telling us more of what heaven will look like. Look at verse 3. We see the verse 2, he, verse 2 of these seven in verse 3. He says, For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. He says, The throne of God, the, the Lamb, that will be there. Have you ever had maybe the best intentions? in a Bible study, a devotional reading, or a worship service, 
to really connect with the Lord, to worship Him, to listen to Him, to learn from His Word, and only to, to be distracted. Anyone ever had that experience? You think about the grocery list, maybe. You see George sitting in front of you, you go, is, that, is his hair thinning a little bit? Or, you know, you look over to the left or right and go, I think that person's wearing the same shirt I'm wearing. Like, whatever the dynamic is, it's easy to kind of find ourselves constantly riddled with the reality that we're not quite there yet. But in heaven, the throne of God, the Lamb, will be there, front and center, no distractions whatsoever. The martyred missionary, Jim Elliott, once said this, eternity will be at one and the same time a great eye-opener and a mouth shutter. The throne of God and the Lamb are there. That's what we're fixated upon. The second will we see in this verse is his servants will worship him. You know, often people kind of carry one or two very common misconceptions about what eternity will be like. If there's this thought of hell, it's this concept or this mindset that it's a place where all those that want nothing to do with God, well, they have it their way. And they're free from all that. And in some sense, it's seen as like a party of sorts. That's a misnomer. That's a mistake. Nothing could be further from the truth. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 says, the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what hell is like. Another misconception is that in heaven, well, man, it'll be boring. You know what C.S. Lewis says about heaven? He said, joy is the business of heaven. I think Disney World tries to propagate that truth. No, I've been there. Joy is the business of heaven. The throne of God, the Lamb, are front and center. There's no distractions. And we will be with the King forevermore. And it says we'll be worshiping. Other translations, maybe the New King James in front of you says we'll be serving him. I love what Pastor Jim Lassine, Jeff Lassine says about this. He says, so we will be serving God. The, the natural question is, serving him by, by doing what? I think the answer to this question is found by going back to the original paradise of Eden. There in Eden, God gave Adam and Eve dominion and stewardship over the creation. And I believe this is what one of the primary ways in which we'll serve God. I believe that when he recreates the heaven and earth, there will include a universe that is not only vast beyond comprehension, but perhaps limitless. So every believer may be assigned to a portion of the universe as a caretaker or as a steward. And he, he kind of gives this insight. He says, scientists have pointed the Hubble telescope toward one of the emptiest regions of the universe. The telescope was focused on a region roughly the size of a grain of sand held out at an arm's length, and what scientists saw was layer upon layer of galaxies, each one containing billions of stars. And whatever the size of our universe, I believe the new heavenly universe will far exceed it. It will be ours both to enjoy and to care for. Interesting thought. The dynamic, though, from these verses is very clear. This will be a perfect environment with a perfect job description for all of us. And these handful of verses give us a glimpse of what that'll be like. Look at verse 4 of Revelation chapter 22. They will see his face. His name will be written on their foreheads. There'll be no more night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. John writes, we will see his face. His name will be on our foreheads. There'll, there'll no longer be need for a light of any kind. There's no night there. God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. Now, there are still a great many mysteries about what is to come. I mean, Paul wrote about this in, in Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. He said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined 
what God has prepared for those who love him. C.S. Lewis put it this way, our ability to imagine what eternity will be like is like two infants in a womb talking about what they will be doing once they're born and 25 years old. Like, that just doesn't happen. But some things we do know, heaven will be glorious. Warren Wiersbe says this, not only shall we be servants in heaven, but we'll also be kings. We'll reign forever and ever. And this speaks of sharing Christ's authority and glory. And as believers, we're seated with Christ in heavenlies today, but in the eternal state, we shall reign as kings over new heavens and earth. What an honor. What grace. Certainly, many interesting questions could be asked about our future abode in heaven, but most must go unanswered until we reach our glorious home. One author put it this way, when you think of heaven, you can't help but smile. And Charles Spurgeon used to say to his young students in ministry, he said, when you talk about heaven, let your face light up with a heavenly glow. And when you talk about hell, your everyday face will do just fine. <laughs> right? Sure, there, there is a lot of mystery still about what is to come. 1 Corinthians 2, no, it's not entered within the heart of men exactly all that God has prepared. But did you read Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5? There's enough there to, as Charles Spurgeon would say, put a smile on your face. And let me put it this way if I can. The reality of heaven should warm our hearts to worship. The reality of heaven should solidify joy in our hearts. The reality of heaven should motivate our lifestyle towards endeavors of eternal value, eternal weight. The reality that you're here this morning reading how the story ends should motivate our hearts to worship God. It's the only thing that I think can solidify joy in our hearts permanently. Knowing who Christ is, what he's done, and what he has yet to do. And heaven, the reality of heaven, should motivate our lifestyles, our choices, our entertainment, our values, how we raise our children towards things that have eternal weight. Eternal value. Wearsby said this. He said, heaven, it's, it's more than a destination. It's a motivation. And if we're motivated by heaven, then we're going to keep moving forward for the kingdom of God. And in my opinion, that's kind of how John then lays out the rest of this chapter. He closes this book and reminds us of at least four important things in light of this afterlife that we have to look forward to. And as we look at these closing verses this morning, this last chapter of the Bible, I want to remind us of four ways our lives should be motivated to action that carry that, that value and that weight that has eternal value. Number one, this will come from verses 6 through 13. It's simply this. Keep following Jesus. Look at verse 6 with me. John writes this. Then the angel said to me, everything you've heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of the prophecy written in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw all these things, and when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, no, don't worship me. I'm a servant of God, just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in this book. Worship only God. Verse 10, then he instructed me, do not seal up the prophetic words in this book, for the time is near. Let the one who's doing harm... Continue to do harm. 
Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What are some takeaways from this? Number one, keep following Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Quite simply, obey him. Amen. Obey him. John 14, 15, Jesus said this, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Look at verse seven there in Revelation 22. Blessed are those who, it starts with an O and ends with a Y. What do you think it says? Obey. obey. Blessed are those who obey the prophecy of this book. Verse 12, I'm bringing my reward with me to repay people according to their deeds. Why should people follow Jesus? It's tucked within these verses. Look at verse 6. Everything you've heard and seen is trustworthy and true. Everything we've been reading in this book is dependable and reliable. The Old Testament prophecies about Jesus have come true. So will the words of these last day's prophecies. You know, just think about our own country. Not every founding father of our country was a Christian, but the very judicial system our country is built upon is built from the principles of God's word. The fabrics of scriptures are interwoven into how we govern ourselves. And God's word was and is the standard for truth. And we live in a day, we live in a time when which everyone wants to define what is true and what isn't. And God's word is true. Jesus claimed and proved to be the way, the truth, and the life. And just as he says of himself in John 14, no one can come to the Father except through him. Why should I follow Jesus? Because Jesus is the way the truth, the life. As John is hearing this message given, it's like this angel comes back and says, listen, John, everything you've seen, everything you've heard is dependable and reliable. Jesus and Jesus alone is the one to follow. Now, I'm not certain of what an angel looks like. Earlier in our study, when we were kind of looking at those four living creatures surrounding the throne, do you remember that image? Let me show it with you real quick. Show it to you real quick. Like, this is like from a German artist who, who kind of has this rendering of taking all what's described in Revelation chapter 4 about these creatures that are around the throne of heaven, just saying, holy, holy, holy. And these one creature is just covered in eyes. I can understand if an angel has any kind of semblance of that, why John would just fall down and begin to worship. But as it says there in that chapter, the only one to worship is God. Look at verse 9. Don't worship me. I'm a servant of God just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well, all those who obey what is written in this book. Worship only God. And Jesus, speaking of himself in this passage, says, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the first. I am the last. So what's our takeaway? Keep following Jesus. Keep following him. You know, one of the greatest Bibles that has resources in it that are really helpful is the Life Application Bible. Listen to what that Bible says about this portion of Scripture when it's talking about not sealing up the prophetic words of this prophecy. It says, instead of sealing up what's been written as Daniel had been commanded to do, John was told, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. John's prophecy was to be left open so that all could read and understand. This message was needed immediately by the churches of John's day as well as believers across all the years until Christ's return. Daniel's message has been sealed because it's not a message for Daniel's time, but the book of Revelation was a message for John's time and is relevant today. As Christ's return approaches, there's an increased polarization between God's followers and Satan's. 
We must read the book of Revelation, hear its message, and be pre prepared for Christ's return. See, this angel, as he's speaking to John, he's saying, listen, Jesus is the one to follow. Don't, don't seal up the prophecies of this book, but let everyone everywhere hear this message. And he says something that's interesting here in verses 10 and 11. I don't know if you caught this, but where he says, let the one who is doing harm continue. Let the one who is vile continue. Do you see that there in, in verses 10 and 11? Is that like a proof text for those that are not following Jesus that you've got a verse that says, listen, I don't have to. It says right here. No. It comes on the heels of what's being said, that the time is near and that ultimately choices lead to consequences. One author puts it this way, like a train running down a track, the consequences will ultimately come for the choices we make. God is always calling people to repent. But when Christ returns, the opportunity will have passed. This is the call to the readers to make up their minds now and live for God because people will reap the consequences for the kinds of lives they have led. The point, follow Jesus now. And it's like in the, the next three verses, he really drives this point home. Look at verse 14 through 16. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They'll be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and to eat the fruit of the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. It's this clear, simple call to follow Jesus. Now, depending on which translation you have in front of you, a New King James or New Living, it says that it talks about those who are washing their robes or those who do his commandments. And they're speaking of the same thing with different imagery, a changed life, a life that follows Jesus. That's the true marker of a saved life. And it's interesting. As you read this passage, it's like Jesus is saying, I am the one who approves this message, right? The source of David, the heir to his throne. And he's calling everyone in light of eternity as not just a destination but a motivation to follow him today. Pastor Greg Laurie said this. He said, every single time we read about what the Bible says about the future, there's always an exhortation to live a godly life. God doesn't give us Bible prophecy to entertain us, but to wake us up and to call us to live for him. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says this, the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly like a thief. The heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. The very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. So just be informed of what's gonna happen. No, then it says this, since everything around us is gonna be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. The first of the four ways our lives should be motivated in light of heaven is simply this. Keep following Jesus. That, that's one of the biggest takeaways from the book of Revelation. In light of all that I see of who God is, what he's done, what he's doing, what he plans to do, I should keep following him. And the second one is this. Keep sharing Jesus. Look at verses, verse 17 with me, if you would. It says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who's thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life. Here is the heart of God. Come unto me. 
deep inside, we're all hungry, thirsty. And, and no accomplishment, relationship, possession, experience will ever fill you. Only God can do that. And so God says, come unto me. Let all those who are thirsty, let anyone who hears, let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life come to me. Let me ask you, do you need to come to Jesus to be forgiven of your sin, to take away your guilt, to satisfy that spiritual hunger and thirst? That is the message of God today. Come unto him. If you know Jesus, don't just keep following him, but keep sharing him. Come unto me, he says. And as we finish our journey through this glorious book, we see heaven not just as a destination, but a motivation. And we want to keep following Jesus, keep sharing Jesus. But as it says in verses 18 and 19, here's the third, and fi- third takeaway. Keep the words of Jesus. Verse 18. I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from the book of this prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and the holy city that is described in this book. You know what he's saying? Don't mess with the book of Revelation. That's what he's saying, (laughs) right? Deceptively or disregard or disobey or distort the Scripture in any way. It's not the job of the Bible to catch up with culture. The Bible is absolute truth. And when we stray from it, we do so to our own pain. Culture always needs to be conforming to Scripture, not the other way around. So keep the words of Jesus. It's a serious matter to tamper with God's Word, carrying extreme consequences. So keep the words of Jesus. Keep sharing Jesus. Keep following Jesus. And lastly this morning, look at verses 20 and 21. Keep looking for Jesus. Verse 20, he who is faithful witness to all these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. It's like John responds, come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. Keep looking for the return of Jesus. Keep following, keep sharing, keep the words, and keep looking for Jesus. Jesus is coming quickly. Now, you may say, quickly, 2,000 years ago, this was written. What do you mean by quickly? As we've read through the book of Revelation, I wonder if you were with us during that series that Jesus is full of mercy and justice that when judgment comes, it will come quickly, like dominoes falling in, in succession, rapid succession, that when judgment comes, it's like a watershed moment. It's here. When Jesus comes for his people, when Jesus brings that final time of reconciliation of all things, It will happen fast. And so John replies, Yes, Lord, come quickly, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with us all. Now, this morning, we've been given a bit of insight into what's to come in eternity. And I would say, I would share that it's glorious. And I would share that heaven, not just as a destination, but as a motivation, should warm our hearts to worship. That if you'll allow it to, this this concept and reality of what's to come for the people of God should solidify in our hearts joy. Joy. Knowing who Jesus is and what he's done and what he has prepared 
for his people. And it should motivate our lives towards a lifestyle, towards things in our life that we're engaged in that have eternal weight and eternal value. And what that looks like, it looks like following Jesus, keeping on, keeping on, sticking and staying with him. It looks like sharing Jesus. It looks like keeping the words of Jesus. And it looks like always looking for Jesus and his soon return. So what's our response to this? I think it's a fresh and daily surrender to him. To know that God is in control. That Jesus, as the one who came as that humble servant to pay for our sin's debt, is now glorious and risen and in a place of authority and power and is working out his master plan. And there will be a time at the end where all sin and death consequence are done away with. And we will live with him forevermore. We'll reign with him forevermore. We'll be with him forevermore. So in light of that today, let's follow Jesus, share Jesus, keep the words of Jesus, and be looking for Jesus. This morning, we'll celebrate that beautiful reality of coming to the living water through the waters of baptism, this time of profession for all those to declare, I belong to Jesus. He's washed away my sins, made me whole. He's the one that satisfies that spiritual hunger and thirst and paid the debt that I could never pay. And so this morning, I want to encourage us as we close in a time of worship to come and drink freely from the water of life who is Jesus. Jesus, that great King and Savior, the one who is to come, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last.